Primary election day in Iowa is only a few weeks away, and early voting started this week. Where do Democrats running for Iowa's U.S. Senate seat stand on the issues? Those three candidates are here at Iowa PBS for this special live Iowa Press debate. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation, the Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com. For decades, Iowa Press has brought you political leaders and newsmakers from across Iowa and beyond. Live from the Iowa PBS studios in Johnston, Iowa, this is a special U.S. Senate Democratic primary debate. Here is moderator Kay Henderson. Welcome inside Iowa PBS studios here in Johnston. We have three Democratic candidates for the U.S. Senate seat in Iowa who have gathered. They're on your primary ballot. They're hoping to win that primary for a chance to challenge Republican U.S. Senator Chuck Grassley in November. Let's meet the candidates. Abby Finkenauer of Cedar Rapids is a former state representative who served one term in the United States House of Representatives. Mike Franken of Sioux City is a retired U.S. Navy Vice Admiral who ran for the U.S. Senate primary two years ago. And Glenn Hurst is a doctor and a member of the Minden City Council. Candidates, welcome. Thank, Thank you. you. Joining me tonight and asking questions are Aaron Murphy. He is the Des Moines Bureau Chief for the Gazette in Cedar Rapids. And Brian Fonensteel is the Chief Politics Reporter at the Des Moines Register. Now, a question for all of you from me to begin things. We'll start with Abby Finkenauer. Uh, Donald Trump handily won Iowa twice. Uh, Democrats Bruce Braley, Patty Judge, and uh, Teresa Greenfield have lost three most recent U.S. Senate races in Iowa. Why would you fare differently? Every single time I have been on the ballot as a Democrat for federal office, we have gotten more votes than the Democrats above us who have had more money. And that is because of the coalition of voters we bring together here. I mean, I grew up in a small town a little bit north of Dubuque called Cheryl. It's got more cows than people. And my dad was a union pipe fitter welder, and my mom was a public school secretary. And it is folks like my parents who I fight for every single day. It is why we're proud to have the endorsement of the Iowa Federation of Labor. I mean, that's 55,000 hardworking men and women across the state who are working their tails off every single day for their family, and they expect somebody to do their jobs and have their backs. That is who I am. That is what I've done in that state house. It's what I did in Congress, and that is what I will do as the next United States Senator. And the biggest piece is this. It is about the contrast between Senator Grassley and I. He has never faced anything like this before. And it is about the differences of the fact that I will never forget where I come from and who I fight for and why I'm in this race. He is somebody who's been in DC for nearly 50 years. I mean, the guy has owned a house in Virginia since I was five years old. It is time that we have somebody doing the work, bringing people together, and that is the work I have always done and, again, would be proud to do as the next United States Senator from Iowa. Mike Franken, what's the argument for your candidacy? Well, I think it's time that Iowa wants to see Chuck Grassley be retired. And so the question is, which Democrat candidate do we want to elect? And uh, with, a, with a concentration in rural Sioux County, Iowa, growing up, and a broad perspective in, in an adult life, I believe I offer Iowa a, a, a grand scope of, of activity that I'm happy to, I'm very pleased, privileged, and honored to have to have this opportunity. And I'm confident by the, by the appearance of our, our, our 
influencers and our volunteers. We've had a fabulous uh, campaign thus far, and I believe this, uh, this rousing um, acceptance that I've gotten from the state of Iowa, this time around in particular, will follow through to November, and we'll beat Chuck Grassley handedly. Glenn Hurst, let's hear from you. Sure, sure. thank you very much. It, it's a, a great question. I think you just, if for me, you left off one part of the stem, which was before Donald Trump won, Barack Obama won twice in this state. And he was a dark horse candidate uh, that came to Iowa and, and worked the stump and, and was, an, it was speaking about being an agent of change. And that's really what Donald Trump did as well. Uh, now, it's a radically different change, but it was appealing to Iowa voters. And then we as a Democratic Party put forward three candidates that were really uh, relatively moderate candidates like you like you shared, Patty Judge, uh, Braley, uh, Teresa Greenfield. These were folks who really uh, came from the centrist side of the Democratic Party. Uh, and they lost because they didn't appeal to that uh, desire for change. Iowa voters have an opportunity on this election to make a change and make a selection of a, another set of moderates, a, a, a cinema-like candidate, or a mansion-like candidate, or a Harkin-like candidate. And I would be happy to be the Harkin candidate for Iowa. This question goes to Mike Franken first. A white gunman opened fire in a Buffalo, New York grocery store over the weekend, targeting black shoppers in a racist attack. What more could Congress do to address hate crimes? Well, <clears throat> We should certainly, number one, uh, address our gun laws in America. Uh, secondly, uh, crimes such as that, we have uh, standing, uh, standing laws, uh, but, but the, the, the great expanse of opportunities that we should be working on in this, in this country to go after the divisions which are fomented by certainly the GOP in many respects uh, that we have been accepting of I believe that's job number one. Uh, we can pass additional laws to address hate crimes, and, and I believe we've done, amp we've done a lot of that in the past, uh, but we, we, we need to also look into social media and monitor these actions. You know, it's interesting, after 9-11, we asked the Muslim community in America to self-police themselves. And uh, matter of fact, it was, it was re quite successful where we moderated the message. Uh, but we have the same issue going on in the far right. And we've let it uh, run for too long. We need to get tough about this. And we need to prosecute, investigate, and prosecute those responsible. And uh, the laws are there. We just need to get action. Glenn Hurst, what more can Congress do on hate crimes? They can do so much more on hate crime than what we've been doing. Uh, and what, what we're hearing uh, already uh, is the idea of let's just keep doing things the way we do things in Washington, D.C. Uh, and that is not the agent for change that Iowans are looking for. When we talk about uh, hate crimes and, and the use of guns and violence, this isn't a new problem. Uh, let's take this back to, to Charlottesville even. Uh, we had a huge opportunity uh, and, and motivation in this country to address gun laws and address hate crimes, and our government chose to do nothing. Uh, we've sat back and we've waited, and, and we've still really done almost nothing to get uh, assault uh, rifles off of our, our streets. Uh, we're doing very little uh, to protect our populations of, of color and populations of, of immigration. I mean, we're still building a wall. So we've got, we've got to have a complete change in the way we do business in Washington, D.C. And, and I think that uh, the motivation to do that uh, doesn't need to come by waiting for another gun incident to happen uh, or waiting uh, for another hate crime. The time is now. Uh, we should be arriving day one uh, and making uh, common sense gun laws in, in Washington, D.C. Abby Finkenauer, what would be your approach? Well, first of all, I just want to say the white supremacy in this country and the way that we have seen the rhetoric just ratchet up and the extremists getting louder and louder is absolutely horrifying. This should not be happening in the United States of America in the year 2022, and yet here we are. It is on every single leader, our community leaders, all the way up to federal leaders to call it out as they see it and make sure that whoever, if they are their supporters, that they're telling them that this is wrong. That is the first thing. 
The second thing is this, as I think about this right now and you asked the question, honestly, all I could think about was uh, this earlier this week, I was in Iowa City and I met uh, Roland and he was there and Roland is a black man that lives in Iowa City. And afterwards I am talking to him and he told me that this week he has not made it to the grocery store yet. And he goes, I know, I know in the back of my head, I know why I haven't. That's terror. That's terror in the way that that shouldn't be happening again in the United States of America, yet here we are. That's not freedom of not being able to go to the grocery store or send your kids to school or an after prom party and not know if they're gonna come home or not because they might get shot. We have a problem in this country and it needs to be dealt with with leaders who are willing to do it. So one, I'd make sure that I was doing my job as a United States Senator, passing a bill that I already voted for and signed on to in the U.S. House while I was there called H.R. 8, actually cracking down on background checks and making sure we close those, uh, those loopholes, having red flag laws. But the biggest piece is this, when it comes to the extremism, there is a bill, the COVID-19 Hate Crimes Act, that needs to actually be passed the United States Senate where there'll be more funding tracking down these extremists and making sure that we stop this happening in our country. Aaron? Buffalo was sadly not alone across several major U.S. cities last weekend. Gunshots killed at least 18 people and wounded dozens more. Glenn Hurst, we'll start with you this time, and all of you got into this a little bit, but let's talk about specifics. What changes to gun and ammunition laws and regulations, if any, would you vote for as a senator? Well, I think this is incredibly important. I can be, and I can be very specific uh, about what we, we need to do and, and why. Uh, in Pottawatomie County, in Council Bluffs, uh, less than a year ago, uh, a militia embedded itself in our uh, sheriff's department uh, when they closed down the, the community uh, because of a potential threat of a, of a, a riot uh, following the George Floyd uh, murder. And what we saw was this local government agency embracing uh, militants on the street with their weapons, not sending them home when the uh, curfew went into effect, uh, and essentially allowing them uh, a bully pulpit in our, in our streets. Uh, we absolutely need to ban assault uh, weapons. There's, there's really only, only one purpose for those, and that is to kill large numbers of people in a short period of time. We also need to control uh, the access to ammunition and control the access to uh, magazine clips or, or, or other devices like bump stocks that turn uh, other weapons into a more automatic style weapon. Uh, there is just no time to wait anymore. Uh, we've had that time, and the, and the time to act is now. Abby Fickner, you touched on a few. Are there other measures that you'd be interested in addressing? Yeah, look, I think this is something, whether it is HR 8 and getting that through the United States Senate, there's plenty more to do. And it's one where I truly believe we can bring Iowans together on it and also Americans when we take the fear out of it. I mean, I still remember in 2018 when I was running for Congress, I was in Marshalltown talking to a group of bricklayers. And there was a guy standing there, he had a, uh, I think it was a Cabela's hat on, and you know, he looked at me, and this was right after Parkland. And he says, well, I got a question about guns. I said, okay, I, let's talk. And because I'm, you know, pro Second Amendment, but we need to do smart things when it comes to curbing gun violence. And the question he asked me with tears in his eyes was how do we keep our kids safe in schools who are getting shot up? I mean, this is something we shouldn't be afraid to talk about because, I mean, I grew up in a house where dad was a pheasant hunter. I mean, where you should be able to go hunting on the weekends and send your kids to school in Iowa and in the United States of America and not be afraid, are they coming back home or not? And so there's plenty more to do, whether it is HR 8, whether it is actually making sure that we have red flag logs, red flag laws to be able to cut down on extremism of people actually getting Getting those guns in the first place. Um, but again, there's plenty more to do, and I look forward to being able to do that as a United States Senator and also bring Iowans along with us. The other thing I'll say also about the background check bill, 94% of gun owners in this country support that. And you've got Chuck Grassley, who's been sitting in that United States Senate, literally blocking the bill. Mike Franken. So um, I grew up with firearms. 
It's been part of my professional life. There's no one in Washington, D.C. or in Iowa or in the NRA who's going to gunsplain me. And I doubt if anybody will happy, happy to have a debate with me on what we should do for responsible firearm ownership in America. So from indemnity insurance to hardening of society at, at, the, at the expense of uh, firearm sales and ammunition sales, to background checks, similar to the United States military does for surplus firearm sales. A five-step program, two background checks, in-situ training. Those people are responsible gun owners. They do not commit crimes, they store their firearms properly, and they're mentally and physically capable and they understand the effects of them. Uh, from being a land forces commander, to being arming, uh, to guarding nuclear weapons, my extensive experience in this makes me a superlative person on the committee to draft these laws and enforce them. Background checks, et cetera, and a whole, for magazine size, there's a hundred things that can be done. And responsible gun ownerships and owners in America, every one of them, every responsible one will agree with me because this, was, this is what we deserve and it's what those who have never handled a firearm also deserve. All three of you candidates support abortion rights, and this question will go first to Mike Franken. Um, as a senator voting on um, a bill to guarantee abortion access nationwide, yeah. would you support limits like parental consent or perhaps defining fetal viability? Um, the, the best person to an answer this is a doctor and the, and the woman, but if, as a as a man, I would say, no, I believe that this is the responsibility of the mother, of the woman, and uh, her doctor. Uh, so I don't believe we ought to have uh, oversight laws respond that, are, that respond to that. And, uh, and, I'm, and I believe this, we ought to codify. Glenn Hurst. Well, I, I appreciate uh, Mike uh, coming along to, to that because uh, when we had a, a forum earlier in Carroll, Iowa, uh, it was it was a, a more different answer about uh, discussion between a husband and his and his wife. Uh, but we absolutely uh, want to assure that a woman has control of her body's her body at all times. Body autonomy is part of being an American, uh, and one should always have body autonomy. I, as a physician, can't make you donate blood to save someone's life. I can't make you give a kidney to somebody who might match you. I can't take your kidney from, from your body after you've died without your permission. Uh, body autonomy is, is a guarantee of being an American. Uh, and a woman not having the ability to control her body at all times through a pregnancy uh, is, would, would be out of the question. It, it's certainly a federal issue. It needs to be codified immediately. I've stated that I would codify, I would write the law if necessary, because we absolutely cannot have second-class citizenry here uh, for, for women. It just, it, it's like going back into the dark ages. So I, I would support 100% woman having her ability to choose whenever. Abby Finkenauer? Look, this decision belongs between a woman and her doctor, full stop. Um, I'll also say this, pregnancy is complicated. It is not black and white. It is why this decision belongs between a woman and her doctor. But I'll also say this, what is happening right now in our country, I mean, you've got Oklahoma today passing a law making it illegal to get an abortion at fertilization. That's about control. That's about controlling women, controlling their health care, and quite frankly, women will die. It is horrific what is happening in this country, the extremism that has taken over and taking away my rights as a woman standing here today. You have a Supreme Court who doesn't want to actually do what they should do and actually uphold our rights. It's extraordinary. It is why we need somebody standing on the floor in 2023 in the United States Senate who is a woman of childbearing age, who is, who does actually have a personal stake in this. I mean, it's absurd to me that we don't have more voices standing on that floor right now. And unfortunately, I've already had to defend my rights as a woman three times on the state house floor, and I'm prepared to do it again in the United States Senate. And folks, wouldn't it be nice to be able to replace
the oldest man currently in the United States Senate with the youngest woman in history ever to get there and do it in a way where we're replacing him who has sat there. He led to Merrick Garland being not nominated, blocking that, leading to the Supreme Court, one of his first votes ever as a United States senator in his first year was a constitutional ban on abortion. This is the stakes here, and we can make him pay for it. Glenn Hurst, as the Supreme Court appears ready to overturn Roe versus Wade, some Democrats have begun pushing for a restructuring of the Supreme Court. Would you support expanding the number of justices from 9 to 13? I would not support it from 9 to 13. I support it from 9 to 19. I believe that we add two justices uh, every two years until we reach the point of having 19. Uh, that gives us an opportunity uh, to elect people who are going to run those confirmation hearings. But this is a place where I really am, am very different from my competitors uh, who are planning to go to, to Washington, D.C. And, and continue business as usual. Uh, I believe that uh, changing the Supreme Court structure is just one of those pieces. What we also need to be doing is adjusting the way we do business as a U.S. Senate. I'm looking at comprehensive Senate rules reform, rules that have kind of sat stagnant for a long time. We shouldn't have to worry about whether or not a justice is going to get a hearing. That could be a Senate rule. Any appointee receives a hearing within 60 days of appointment. Win or lose, your constituents are going to know how you feel about that candidate. We could have a system where appointment to committees uh, is limited to a specific time period. Uh, we can't institute um, uh, laws that, that uh, prevent you from running for office five, six, seven times. Uh, but we can certainly limit the amount of time you spend on a committee or spend leading a committee. And we can uh, limit the amount of time that a person uh, uh, is able to, to be in that position from a partisan appointment as well. We could go to a lottery system for placement uh, or a seniority system for placement. So we're talking about doing things in Washington, D.C. Uh, radically different from just going and, and trying to operate as usual. Abby Finkenauer, would you support expanding the number of justices to 13? Well, the first thing I would look at is, uh, I don't know if you've heard this or not, but I'm a big fan of term limits. Uh, and I understand the way that the U.S. Supreme Court is structured right now. That is obviously not something that's in the cards, but that is something we could look at actually changing, or we could look at even having them drop down to lower courts and going back up, that type of situation. And that's something that I think we should look at, um, specifically given the makeup of our Supreme Court and the fact that it has become so partisan. You've got these folks who sit there right now and it's basically dependent upon who we've got as a you know United States president and it shouldn't have to be that way or who's heading up the judiciary like we saw with Senator Grassley um, so I would be really curious about how we actually make sure that there is more certainty about when these folks are moving on and off the court um, than we have right now but the number one thing when we are talking about Roe in particular and and honestly I imagine why you're asking the question right now. We need to get rid of the filibuster in the United States Senate, and we need to codify, codify Roe, but we also need to protect our LGBTQ neighbors and friends across the state in this country, pass the Equality Act. These are all things that, quite frankly, are being stopped right now because you have a United States Senate not willing to do its job and do its work by getting rid of the filibuster to begin with. Mike Franken. I'll attempt to get the award for the most succinct response without aiming to get the most mic time? The answer is no, we can keep it at nine, but we should have term limits, 18 years, so that it doesn't become a partisan placement. Aaron? Abby Finkenauer, if Roe versus Wade is overturned and the right to privacy and other opinions is also believed to be in peril, should the U.S. Senate pass a law legalizing same-sex marriage? Absolutely. I think this is one of those things, again, where when you look at... Uh, what that decision was, the leaked draft, right? They left off Overfell. That said something to me. That said that women and our rights aren't where they're going to stop. And it is our job as federal United States senators or representatives that we have in Congress to do the job to protect Americans across this country and their rights. Again, it is why things like the Equality Act that I passed and I already supported in the House are going to be incredibly important to move in the United States Senate. Mike Franken. Uh, 
Absolutely. Well, the, the, the larger question is why that's even a question in society from a human rights perspective. Why from a, because it's a, it's a God-given right that we should have someone we love as our partner in life. So, of course, we should codify it. Uh, the fact that we have to codify it speaks volumes for the antiquated thought process, I believe, many of us, some people, still, still have. Uh, I think that's a grand idea, and I, and I just wish that uh, the, the, all LBGTQ issues like this would not have to be singled out as standalone issues because we would be more, far more accepting of this in society. Glenn, Glenn Hurst. Well, I think you're going to be hard-pressed to find a Democrat that doesn't support uh, uh, codifying the ability uh, for same-sex uh, marriage. What I think matters uh, for our, our viewers today is uh, really about how we get that done and who's really going to do it. You know, when, when we sent uh, Congressman, Congresswoman uh, Finkenauer to Washington, D.C., uh, we were all pulling for her to deliver on the things that, that we really uh, wanted. And, and when, she, when you, you didn't come out strong for Medicare for All uh, and, and didn't support the Green New Deal uh, and, and didn't vote in favor of the HEROES Act, you know, it really left people disappointed and, and wondering what's the point of, of, of sending, sending people to, to Congress that aren't going to follow through on the values that we have here. Uh, and and, and you know, having, having stars on your, your cap uh, is, not, is also not leadership. This is, you know, we've got two candidates here that are looking to go to Washington, D.C. to keep doing the same thing. I learned leadership from my, my uh, father, uh, a Trump-supporting father, who shows up uh, at the Rotary Club and at the Lions Club and as commander of the vet, you know, was commander of the, the uh, VFW and the American Legion. And though we disagree, leadership is the example he set for me. Dad, don't, don't ever expect me to say that again. Abby Finkenauer, do you have a response? Iowans know me. They know who I am. They know what I fight for. I mean, within the first two weeks of being in the U.S. House, I got to work passing bills, actually showing up for rural America that's been ignored in this country for about two decades at least. And in fact, I actually found a Republican from Utah to help me get it done. I actually passed the bills. When it came to prescription drug reform, I don't have to talk about it. I voted for it. And in fact, it was a bill having Medicare negotiate with drug companies to bring down those prices while we had Senator Grassley over in that U.S. Senate blocking it every chance he got in literally writing the bill so Medicare couldn't negotiate with drug companies. I mean, this is just, again, the things that I have done, whether it is passing the PRO Act, union rights, whether it is addressing the child care crisis in this country, the affordability of it, the accessibility of it, the, equal the quality of it, whether it's paid family leave, whether it's protecting made an American, I am proud of my record, and Iowans know who I am and who I fight for, and it is them, it is the folks across the state, and this country who have been forgotten for far, far too long. Brianne? We're going to move on oh, to some... Can I respond, please? Because <laughs> you said something about my leadership. So, Glenn, really. Um, so, when I was 19, I was a foreman at a slaughterhouse. Age 19. The oldest person I had working for me was 54. I have both national and international awards for leadership. You don't make three-star, you don't become a commanding officer of a ship, you don't have the best ship in the Navy if you're not a leader. I have more leadership than I care to, uh, care to state anymore. Thanks. We're going to move on to some economic issues. Inflation is at a 40-year high. The cost of consumer goods continue to rise. Mike Franken, pre did President Biden's $1.9 trillion American Rescue Plan contribute to that inflation? Definition of inflation, more money than the goods and services there are to buy. Uh, certainly, we flooded the market uh, with money, M1. Uh, there are issues associated with the negative side of that on the recessionary side, which was the, the, the great fear. I don't know. I'm not an economist. I haven't looked at the numbers. History will tell us this. Uh, but certainly, there's a flood of money. And regarding inflation, uh, one of the many factors associated with this is the fact that we've exported so much of our capabilities overseas. And we do recall the pandemic is still very much part of uh, China. And consequently, the goods and services aren't coming here. 
the demand for this is here, and in the corporate world, they're sitting on a fat amount of money. Uh, so some of this is also generated in by corporate greed in America, and uh, and 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 yes, perhaps that was a lot of money, but I don't believe that is the issue associated with today's inflationary tendencies. Glenn Hurst. Sure. I, I think this is one of those places where we're looking for somebody to go to Washington, D.C. to act on their ability to lead. And what we need to lead on is antitrust enforcement. The problem right now, let's look at, at uh, uh, the, the infant formula issue. Uh, this, isn't, this isn't about in inflation. Uh, this is about monopolies. Okay, this is a failure of our, our government uh, to break up the three companies, Abbott, um, Nestle, and, and Mead Johnson, that corner the market on, on uh, our infant formula. And that's the problem we're seeing kind of across uh, industries in this country. Uh, again, it, it's far more about monopolies. You know, what, if, what if this problem was corn? Okay, what if something was wrong with the biggest corn producer in, in this uh, state? right? 85% uh, Monsanto bear. What if their herbicide doesn't work this year? There goes our, there goes our crops. Uh, what if the insecticide doesn't work? There, go, there goes our crops. We have put far too much money uh, in, in single baskets in this nation. Uh, and what we need is leadership to go to Washington, D.C. and break up antitrust. And, and then you'll see uh, that, that corporate greed uh, be addressed that, that Mike uh, referred to. But it's got to it's gotta be far more than just uh, looking at inflation. Abby Finkenauer, did the American Rescue Plan contribute to rising inflation costs? I'll tell you what has led to rising inflation costs. The fact that, yeah, we've got these corporations who are raking in literally record profits right now and passing it on to hardworking families or not passing it on to hardworking families and quite frankly taking advantage of them. We see that right now in oil and gas companies. I mean, I think it was Chevron uh, who just put up $9 billion in profit. I mean, it's absurd what is happening here as you've got people, I mean, I grew up in Cheryl, which is about 20 minutes from Dubuque. So to get anywhere, you're driving like 40 minutes a day to actually get anywhere and be able to get to your job, get to school. And I know Iowans are hurting right now. And I get that they are, they are frustrated and there is work to be done. Part of that is holding those companies accountable. But another piece of that, very specifically when it comes to our goods and services, I mean, it's about supply chain. We have had this domestic supply chain breaking for the last 20 years, and you've had Senator Grassley just sitting there watching it happen for that long. In fact, I put out a plan about addressing that back in December because I'm not somebody who's ever just going to complain about it. I'm going to tell you how we can fix it, and we've got to bring people along with us to do it. We've got a so, couple of quick questions here. Um, a, a quick follow-up to that. Um, we want to ask each of you if you support President Biden's Build Back Better plan, which again would pump trillions more dollars into the economy. And, and do you have any concerns about its passage uh, I impact on inflation? Glenn Hurst, we'll start with you on this one. I, I supported Build Back Better uh, <clears throat> when it was in the uh, 10 and 11 trillion dollar uh, package. Uh, we've got to invest in this country in a way that we have not. We're talking about uh, green jobs. We're talking about infrastructure that hasn't been addressed since, since the original New Deal. So, yes, I would support Build Back Better. Abby Finkenauer? There was one piece of Build Back Better that I was not a big fan of, and that was tax breaks going to folks in New York and California, to be honest with you. That is something that bothered me that was stuck in there, and I think there are plenty of other good things that should get done. I mean, it's things like actually having preschool in this country and pre-K for every kid. That should be done. It's prescription drug reform. That should be done. It's paid family leave. That should be done. Um, and these are things that, again, we should be working on, and and there were problems that I felt the way that that was put together to try to get as many votes as they needed. Partly, honestly, it's why we need to get rid of the filibuster again to actually make these things more bipartisan versus how they built that in the first place. Uh, yes, I believe the, the Build Back Better plan is, is a good plan and the smaller version is a better plan. Uh, but I agree with Abby that some of the tax breaks that were written in there are not advantageous. I suggest we repeal the Trump tax breaks first and piecemeal some of the other leftover ones that were in the Build Back Better to be placed in. Yes. 
Abby Finkenauer, this next question goes to you. Do you support canceling or um, modifying college debt? And if so, what do you say to people who didn't go to college or who paid off their loans already? Well, higher education uh, in this country right now is in a lot of hurt. We've got a lot of our kids right now. I mean, I was a first generation college grad. A lot of kids in Iowa were um, still have about 20 to 30,000 left of student loan debt. Um, I know what that's like. Um, I also know, you know, my dad didn't go to college. He busted his tail every single day trying to put us there. And so this is something that has needed to be dealt with. I think if we do anything when it comes to relief, it should be targeted. I mean, you should not be giving anything to anybody um, who's making over, you know, gosh, $100,000 a year. I mean, that's just not how anything like this should work. But the thing that I've always worked on when it came to student loan debt relief in the first place was how do you actually make sure if there is any relief that you're giving an impact back to your community. And so we should be looking at things, and this is what I worked on in the State House and in Congress, I mean possibly looking at where we've seen a loss in population over the years and is there ways for the federal government to even work with cities and counties to incentivize people to live there and also work in the professions where they're needed as well. Um, that's sure. how we should be looking at this problem. Mike Frank and what's your view on college debt? So college debt, uh, in, in setting it aside, what we're doing is treating a symptom to a larger problem. When I went to school, working in the hog slaughterhouse could pay for an entire, a summer in the slaughterhouse could pay for an entire year at school. Wage scale is not that way. The state doesn't help out in education like it used to. Uh, so there's a, and, 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 and oddly enough, the student loan program makes money off loans. But I believe it's a divisive issue in America to set aside student loans. And for your, for your issue with a union person who pays for that apprentice training uh, and why ultimately they would be helping to pay for someone who may very well be their boss someday and may not even graduate from college. The logistics associated with this that somebody who graduated two years ago, do we recompensate them? What about somebody five years, five years from now who has a large debt? Is this an ongoing thing? And if we constantly wipe out uh, college debt, what do you think the cost of college is going to do? Glenn Hurst? Well, this is a place where I clearly am different from, from my opponents. Uh, I absolutely support repayment of student uh, loans. I, I support paying back people who paid off their loans, and there should be no no cap, uh, as was was referenced, uh, on on who should have that that loan paid back, uh, just because you did well in spite of having been taken advantage of by a predatory loan market, uh, doesn't mean that you don't deserve the equality of of the refund of your of your money. So you know this is this is the 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 difference between going to to dc to do things the way things have, have always been done uh and and going there to do things different and working for the people of iowa i i firmly believe uh that there's no reason uh to not pay that debt back and and we really need to be looking uh even even farther forward to what are we going to do with uh community college uh, schooling that should be free so should uh trade schools Brian. The president took steps yesterday to secure ingredients for baby formula, flying in supplies from other countries. Mike Franken, is it time to change regulations and end tariffs on foreign imports of baby formula? Well, Glenn mentioned this. Absolutely. You know, it's interesting that it's th centered on three industries when most of the ingredients in baby formula, look at the, chemical the chemicals associated with it, come from the United States. And yet uh, we can have manufacturers overseas in Europe of all places with more expensive labor markets, more expensive power to ship the product over here and be less expensive than U.S. Uh, products. Why that's protected, I'm not so sure. It is a critical industry. It is something that has to have resilience, re redundancy, uh, and efficacy in it. But the fact that we are now in this situation where it's a 40% reduction in, in stock because one factory went down, as Glenn was saying, the antitrust that have set that aside where they've gobbled up a series of industries and they've got a corner of a market, it's an atrocious situation. So, yes, if we want to import it, I believe that's the matter of fact, we should have done that some days ago, weeks ago. Glenn Hurst, is it time to change regulations and end tariffs? It, it, it is, but... But you know, why that happened is, is really clear, Mike. It's, it's because we have a government that is set up 
to uh, incentivize monopolies, to sequester wealth at the top 1% of, of our, our nation, uh, and, and that it's actually very anti-competition. So I, I refer back to my, my desire uh, for antitrust enforcement. Uh, but in the short term, the answer is yes, we need, we need baby formula. In the long term, uh, we need to break up those, those companies, but to, to get specifically to the point about um, infant formula, you know, if we had Medicare for all, if we had people who had the guts to go and stand up for that and say, this is what we, what we want, this is what the American people want, then we would be doing so much more breastfeeding. We would be doing so much more maternal care. Uh, we would be far more prepared to take care of uh, our infants than, than we are. And, and formula is just, is just part, a symptom of that problem. Abby Finkhauer. Well, first, I, I just want to say thank you for bringing up this topic. Um, this is something that I saw being an issue, heck, last month as I was watching. I mean, again, here's an example of representation mattering. I'm a 33-year-old woman who's got a lot of friends right now who have little babies, and they are trying to feed them. I mean, and in all due respect, um, breastfeeding is not the answer for everybody, and it shouldn't have to be, and that shouldn't be a response to this question. We've got people right now trying to find the blue one, the, the, the purple one, and, and you know, talking to each other on social media of trying to even ship these across state lines because they can't find it. Again, I was watching this happen over three weeks ago and called on the Biden administration to use the Defense Production Act to actually deal with it. About two weeks before anybody else seemed to have paid attention that this was a problem. Again, what an example of Senator Grassley sitting there being so out of touch of what's actually happening with constituents. So, yes, we should be dealing with the tariffs to be able to get it in as quickly as we possibly can. But this Defense Production Act, I would have liked it actually done three weeks ago when we were requesting it to be done. Glad it is now, but there is plenty more work to do on it, and we need to make sure that this is actually addressed and our folks or our moms and dads across this country are able to feed their babies. Glenn Hirsch, some Democrats in the Senate have proposed a new tax on Americans with accumulated wealth of more than $50 million. Would you vote for a so-called wealth tax? I would absolutely vote for a wealth tax. Uh, what we have seen happen since the Reagan era is this sequestering of money into the hands of the top 1% of Americans. The fact is, as a rural physician, I probably have more in common with a drug dealer on the street in terms of ability to generate wealth in this nation, and that should sound really ridiculous, but it, it sadly is, is not. The ability to generate wealth uh, is about where the wealth sits now. It takes money to make money, and we have set up a, a society that has rewarded people at the top and allowed them tax breaks and tax deductions with the idea that that money was going to trickle down uh, to the folks who need it. Well, it didn't trickle down. We have all the evidence that it didn't trickle down. And it's now time to go reclaim your tax dollars and put them to work for Americans. Abby Finkenauer, would you support a wealth tax? I'd have to see the exact bill and language, but I'll say this. I will never support raising taxes on hardworking Iowans, and I will say the folks at the top making over 50 million are getting away with so much in this country, not paying their fair share as working families in this country have been bearing the brunt of it, and it shouldn't work that way. Um, and I'll say this as well, if you're looking at over $50 million, I don't think there's a whole heck of a lot of Iowans right now um, who would be paying that. These, we're talking about actually leveling the playing field here to make sure that the brunt isn't on working families, that you've got these people at the top who keep getting all of these tax cuts, all of these tax breaks, and not the folks doing the work, you know, picking up, uh, you know, your garbage on the side of the road once a week, the folks who are sweeping the floors, the folks who are busting their tails every day, again, like I saw my parents do and get screwed because of people like Senator Grassley who have sat there and have gone along with it for decade after decade. I've had enough of it, and that is who I'm fighting for in the United States Senate. Mike Franken, would you vote for a welcome? Well, does anybody think the animus now displayed by Elon Musk and uh, Jeff Bezos has anything other than to do with uh, this administration's uh, ultimate uh, designs to put tax on them at the high end? Of course it is. These are hugely greedy individuals who have not been paying their fair share. And, but what's 
greater needed, Aaron, is a broader tax to look at the capital gains associated with uh, various property ownerships. That I mean, this is a this is a ripe area for uh, additional revenue to bring in the type of medical care that I had. But we should also be talking about Social Security. Why we have a hundred and forty-seven thousand dollar cap on who pays Social Security for income is ridiculous. Lift that cap. Suddenly, Social Security becomes financially solvent for perpetuity. Let's do that as well. Why do we even not? Think about that. Put it in a reconciliation bill and make it happen. Brian? Medicare for All legislation has been introduced in Congress that would extend Medicare coverage to all Americans and eliminate private health insurance. Would you vote for that legislation? Glenn Hurst, I'll start with you. Well, I've been really clear on this on the, the campaign trail. Uh, I absolutely would vote for the Medicare for All Act. As a matter of fact, uh, on day one, I would sign on as a, as a co-sponsor for it. This act serves to uh, provide health care and, and opportunities uh, to every American in, in this nation. It's also a great tool for rural recovery. There's so many great things that, that come out of this act. Providing care for those 85 million people uh, who currently don't have care uh, insurance or, or are underinsured. Uh, I think it's incredibly important to know that it is the only act that's on the table right now to address health care. That we can't be just putting band-aids on cannonball wounds. We can't be taking the, the uh, Affordable Care Act and expanding it or adding a Medicare option to it. Those are not on the table. They don't work. Medicare for all is the solution. Abby Finkenauer, would you vote for that legislation? No, because what we need to do, uh, we need to actually up Medicare reimbursement rates. If that is not done, we are going to have a problem in this state when it comes to who is getting access to health care. It is what I worked on while I was in Congress. But what I do support is upping those Medicare reimbursement rates and having a public option that folks can get into that's like Medicare that they can have if they want it. But also, I mean, if they have negotiated their health care through their union, through their employer, and they like it, I'm not taking away anybody's health care from any Iowan or any American. Um, we need to make sure that that is very clear, but that they have an option to actually be in, like Medicare, if they so choose, which, by the way, would add competition into the marketplace to bring down private insurance anyway. Mike Franken, would you support existing Medicare for All legislation? Well, so, so I wouldn't have this opportunity in life to be standing before you had it not been for the comprehensive health care that the military provides for our special needs daughter. Uh, so this is this opens doors for people. So I'm a big fan of this, uh, and 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 to and to really work on the pharmaceuticals as well. But was, so how do how to implement this? I agree with Abby that it should we should bump down to say Medicare for all who want it down to age 50, and then start on the bottom perhaps from from uh, birth to say age five, and narrow it down to ensure the Medicare process system has an opportunity to grow into itself. You can't just do it and execute it. It won't work. So it needs to be incremental, but I believe this is a the future of America. It will make us all better. Candidates, we're going to ask each of you a question, and it's about something that Democrats are saying about your candidacy. We'll start with Abby Finkenauer. Um, you had the bare minimum of signatures in one county and almost didn't make it onto the primary ballot. Why did you choose to criticize the judge who handled that case instead of owning up to your own candidate's action, uh, your own campaign's actions? Well, I'll say this. Uh, look, when I got into this race, I knew uh, the GOP was going after me, and that is clearly what they did in this scenario. They spent thousands of dollars and hours going through, trying everything they could to make it so that I was not the one going up against Senator Grassley, and they lost. The judge was wrong. We had a Republican Secretary of State's office affirm my petitions. We had a bipartisan panel affirm the petitions. And then we had a lower court judge ignore the bipartisan panel, ignore 30 years of precedent, and got overturned by seven Iowa Supreme Court justices. We are on the ballot, but I'll say this. Uh, next time, I think I'm going to end up with 50,000 signatures, uh, just to make sure. And again, know that 
this is kind of just where they're at right now. This is what they do, and we won, we beat them already, and we intend to beat them again in November. Um, for viewers of Iowa Press, Rob Sand, who's a fellow Democrat, the state auditor, said you shouldn't have criticized the judge. He was a good judge. He was just following the law. Look, I'm always going to stand up when I think something is wrong. Um, seven Supreme Court justices agreed the lower court decision was wrong. I stood up for ourselves, from our campaign, for Iowans across the state, and quite frankly, for democracy. That is what I'll do as a United States senator. I right now have no problem calling out these U.S. Supreme Court justices who've got it wrong and are going after my health care. If that's who you want as a United States Senator, that's who I will be. I will always call out the wrong as I see it and have the backs of Iowans and folks in this country, again, who've been ignored for far, far too long. Mike Franken, you've positioned yourself as a moderate, but moderate Democrats have failed to beat Chuck Grassley for years, often by extreme margins. Isn't it time for Democrats to try a new approach? I didn't know I was uh, declared a moderate. That's news. but. Uh, whatever that declaration is. This is a state where some counties have went 20% for Obama and then 20% for Donald Trump. It's that middle segment who want logical, pragmatic, smart, dedicated national servants to work for them, leader servants. Um, I believe I'm that person. Uh, I was asked today by the Des Moines Register, where am I on the scale of progressive and moderates. And I said, well, that's a very jagged edge. Uh, in social programs, I'm very progressive. Uh, in some issues overseas and foreign affairs, I'm uh, inventive. And, uh, and I'm all over the map. This is a response to a learned situation as, a, as an executive for 40 years. Glenn. Glenn Hurst, you had less than $50,000 in your campaign account at the end of March. Why should Democrats trust you to run a credible campaign against an incumbent senator who will have millions of dollars to spend to defend himself? Sure. Whoever wins this race is going to have the millions of dollars that will come from uh, the uh, Democratic National Committee and Chuck Schumer uh, releasing the donors, which we're so grateful he didn't do uh, in the primary. That's how we, how we had a Teresa Greenfield uh, last time. Yes, I do not come with a book of generals uh, and, and uh, international uh, reputation to raise money in this state. Uh, I have a reputation with activists. I'm a Minden City Council person, a uh, town of 600 people. Uh, I'm an activist with the Indivisible Movement, having organized them in southwest Iowa. Uh, I've been an activist with the uh, Iowa Democratic Party as chair of the Rural Caucus, and I even chaired Cindy Axney's district, getting her reelected uh, to her seat. So, uh, yeah, I don't move in, in circles of, of money. Uh, I don't have a book from uh, my congressional campaign to, to dive into as, as well. But what we have had is steady support from, from our coalition. You know, the difference here is uh, I, I'm not running in this race and trying to build a coalition. I am here because of my coalition, and you all know the people in my coalition. You know that there is a Democrat who is a progressive candidate in this race that is different from the other candidates. Candidates, we've reached the final question of this debate. We have just a few minutes left, actually a couple of minutes left. We'll start with you, Glenn Hurst. There are about 600,000 registered Democratic voters in the state. To win a statewide race, you'll need to attract independents and some Republicans to win. What is your message to people who aren't Democrats? So to people who aren't Democrats, I say you should come back to the party because those people who are independents are not people that we've lost from the middle. You, you pointed out our candidates that you're, yourself. We've had plenty of middle of the road candidates that, that should have held on to Democrats. The people that we've bled from the Democratic Party are those people who are progressive and want to see progressive uh, policies done. So come back home. Mike Franken. If you want to see an expanded business environment, if you want to see a great education, the type of education I grew up in where our high school was 99th in the nation, if this is what you envision for Iowa, the progressive state that was the Tom Harkin state, that was the place where we were uh, 150 years ahead of Dred Scott, this is the state that was my Iowa, and I want to re relive that Iowa. You want a higher quality of life, I plan on giving that to you. Join the part. Join, join the team with my great volunteers and influencers throughout the state.
Abby Finkenauer, the last minute. I was my home. It is where I grew up. It is where I will raise a family one day. It is why I'm in this race. It's not about a fancy title. It's not about living in Washington, D.C. It's about the work. That is what I was taught in this state. And quite frankly, it's what Iowans deserve. Right now, we've got a senator who sits there and walks around like he's Mr. Rule America, yet we've lost 30,000 family farms in this state. I've been to his, new, his home, his uh, hometown of New Hartford where I was there for a Save the Post Office rally because it was one of the few things actually on the main street. I've talked to the folks in that town who've said he has not come back and actually talked with them about investments. You have literal uh, main streets just completely hollowed out around this state as he has sat there and watched it happen. If he let it happen to his own hometown, why, does he, why do we think he cares about the rest of us? This is what this race is about. It is making sure we hold him accountable and it's making sure you have somebody who doesn't want to spend their life in Washington, D.C. like he has. Abby Finkenauer, Mike Franken, and Glenn Hurst, thanks for sharing your views with Iowans tonight on this live edition of Iowa Press. And thanks to you for watching. On behalf of everyone here at Iowa PBS, enjoy your evening. Funding for Iowa Press was provided by Friends, the Iowa PBS Foundation. The Associated General Contractors of Iowa, the public's partner in building Iowa's highway, bridge, and municipal utility infrastructure. Iowa PBS is supported in part by Wells Fargo. Fuel Iowa is a voice and a resource for Iowa's fuel industry. Our members offer a diverse range of products, including fuel, grocery, and convenience items. They help keep Iowans on the move in rural and urban communities. Together, we fuel Iowa. Small businesses are the backbone of Iowa's communities, and they are backed by Iowa banks. With advice, loans, and financial services, banks across Iowa are committed to showing small businesses the way to a stronger tomorrow. Learn more at iowabankers.com.